The system was in place slowly in 2017 with the formation, formulation of ICP and approval of LCs, etc. However, our aspiration was shattered with the emergence of the Junta government in 2019. This unfortunate development resulted in the collapse of our endeavor, leading to a substantial financial losses. Finally, we have decided to hold our operation for the MEMA Southeast Asian, uh, Southeast Asia projects. Sikharasi Haraga I Manipuri the Maha Mukra Tajagi, Hogi, Laiba Challenges, the formal trade, ka, informal trade, ki Matanga, Narang uh, Risu, who was up in the Hunisikara discussion to Javani. A way as a businessman, as a trader, Moina. A Hogi Manipura, the formal gi. And informal gi matanga yamkana changjil ek pagi matanga mo orak pa mori gi asigi trading sida aduna adugi system si place to gringa ida thabok hana tarumu me amsi system la amatunga to wahanda gi ba sigi challenges amala pa adu matanga Myanmar government sida Myanmar gi country sida hana leramba hoy gi system si hoy gi Bengal port gi ayam apo su pusalak pa aduna certain tax benefit kara di. Hogi, Bengalum port site the gi lak pumatamda, Pangumdu Malikali, a the Ahoy Swan site, chunky chunk of Matamsida, a hoy matamda a hoy market see uh we used to say sir that our Manipur market we used to say that we have not only Infal market but we have got more market as well. We have got two markets and we've been doing democracy has come back to the government and they have started to oper uh, operationalize the port and different sector has improved. So then our government said also Manipur government, they, they, we, we were trying to put a system on place. However, there were some challenges with the, uh, the check, highway checking of different uh, areas that has that's been with. So that was the challenges we faced uh, those days uh, on that uh, Southeast Asia part, more uh, X part. So, she is my net hanga kiba matunga. Hoi maya magi so na kan saitha karvar si to gusi 2019 matunga idhi hoi si interest kya lagi idre to shu to idre hai tar. Adu bo hoi hoi kida yam karna kano to ambase yam pa orum kala ambase kai nohai kanda maya marum dekhi ana apy am lahe lahe ba. Masigi si amna phaba mukha koi ba. Adu na masigi potsi anavasi hajiksi India agi ham kudi magda anavat sali. In different part of the country, people from Myanmar are seeking medical treatment. That is that is also one part, and for the education part, and also for the religious pilgrimages for for the monk who wanted to visit the Bodh Gaya and all. They come through. They used to come through Myanmar, but they used to come through Moray. But these are been stopped because of this current uh, conflict which they are having in the road. They are facing in the uh, traveling through road. So they are flying from. I think they are flying from Yangon or Mandalay to Calcutta or Delhi. Adu masigi karosida hajiksi. There's a. I think the the government of Manipur has applied for uh, 
flight, uh, direct flight from Myanmar to Imphal. Uh, CEC, CEC medical treatment and uh, for those who are coming from Buddhist pilgrimage and other for education purpose, CEC na flight service to as the approvals will later on the other who privacy Chitagong Donda Han Hogu Male, CEC approvals later laying a lane of his kitten, King of Male. Sigi for similar later. Adubu Atopa Atopa activity can soon improve the Oveni do Hazixi, Langi, Madame Nina, Ketang Hoi, Madongi, Yadu, Sangan, Mazikra, Watkare, Ado Haziki, Ekiski, Matang, Si Amor, Tamamatunga, in a Lachiniba, Hoi Hazizik, Sigi, Nasi, Gedding Sida, Kudung Java, Lujaraga, Hoi Hazizik, Manipurda, Yamkana, Hoi. Economic pressure mukha lay re. Mani pogo mene su yam karna di hone biri koi ye ITP singa lay riba adigi ato ato pa. Wo ham kya adal lay riba singa koi ye go mene na koi ye thabu kya mundi packet biri adu matlab ta tax force kya mundi singa singa biri. Adha hajik si lugri si kai noda koi ye. Tabuxi, Tabugi, Kudung Chavsi, Mutsi, Kanosi, Kradi, Kradi, Krad, Kanoire, Aduna, Masigisi, challenges sing the Akunusum Uzavada, Masi Kamina, Kamina, who faced Oxigay, Kamina, Masigi, Kanosi, Mutsi, Revat, or Oxigay, Kanosi, Kanosi, Revat, Oxigay, Havimatum, the Quikra, who moved from Kratum Tana Zavada, Hajizik, Akuna, Benta, Hazik. Deposit amadi banki borrowings hai. Masigi matang si ma hadi financial transaction amadi cash flow si masi phan bam chang hai. Masi lehen ba aduna masi dekhi da bo ahoi ki bangi blocket ki aadi ki ato pa kanogi lagi basing si itang economic ki kanos condition si yeh biraga masi yaring koi masi da itang wakan thada bhi bam chang hai. Aadi ki ahoi ki ato pa ahoi ki zizik lagi ba poch da. Hoi, Prime Minister Sri Ramkanna, hande ki thada mana scheme ma hogu pase, masi mani purna opportunity ma Ramkanna logu ma matchangi, aje ki uttar purva industrial scheme se, masi ki scheme si hoi mani purgi aje la riba industrial investment promotion scheme se, si ani si ki ani si thegi hai na phava scheme ni, masi ki scheme si adu industrial promotion investment scheme si suya na phava scheme ni adu wo hoi la riba Prasam yang ground level ibas singa madu benefit si lobo ngam gudra madu kita makta kerba skim simbi bay agat lagi haiba dun macangi aduga aziki aziki level ibas industrial promotion skim si na ma pangi investor kita makta o ibas skim lah haiba si masu masih meyam na hangam ama lay adu kita makta aina untang kanu tau jering badi aziki borrowing ka capital financial transaction si Masi matang dah kau ina improve tau ni dah makta, aku ini kalau si income tax ki matang se, si susu aku ini medan beri tau, aku ini tau raga, yang kena aku ini kau ni at least ten years ki income income tax exemption PBU ada na, aku ini yang kena kau ni kau ni masih exemption si yang agi, aku ini financial boost back kau ni lakadra ana kencing, aduh macam tu, asam state kau mana piri ba aku ini aku ini lambda Industrial boost tahun lepas hari tarik orang entrepreneurship ta atau startup sehingga boost tahun lepas mungkin apa ni ba? So for example, ko GST reimbursement ko, stamp duty reimbursement, digital upgradation subsidy, lease rental reimbursement tu, baju mana nak pilih lah ba? Masih kira, ah, koi dah amna entrepreneur sing startup sehingga amna madu gi, karena madu me am bangun ni kanjai. Aduh macam tu, aku ni pun tuh produk sing se, si su mani pukau mana lebih gemi high pilih lah ba? Aduh, ini certain policy yang perlu kita buat. Aduh, tu, aku ini perlu anjali ni. Aku ini manipulasi, ah, kalau tadi policy tadi awal, aku ini dalam sini perlu kita produksi dah 20 percent manipulasi mana lebih ni harus dia awi. Aduh, tujuh tujuh orang ni kalau tu betul betul department sini lah, masih kita posisi, macam mana perlu kita any hello manipulasi atau anything perlu kita sini, aku ini government lah, masih ah. 
department singa moedi ki lebi ni or lebi ki certain kanoma lagi ni hai rakati matu ki suku tang koi ki entrepreneur singa bus tau de mali hana ohum khasi tau jaraga ai nasi kudong chaba ketang pibi nongta oja bagat amati mukhi teli mai mete society ki organizer sing bu singa ai thagat pa amati nuai jaba phanuk thank you thank you mr irathong chom that was indeed a wonderful presentation that you gave so now the chairperson at center for nordic studies jane you as well as a chairperson for center for philosophy by training by training he is a philosopher and i think uh, thinking is his forte and he is a philosopher indeed by training and uh, existential philosophy is and knowledge. Next, I would like to call upon stage Professor Priyoranjan Chongtham, a top gun in policy making in Manipur, and we will get insights of the economy of the activist policy. And next, I would like to call upon stage Dr. Sonal Trivedi, he's an associate professor and an expert in the activist policy. Choose any <laughs> So we would uh, want to felicitate all the guests collectively. So we'll do it one by one. Uh, Professor Manojpan, we would like to kindly felicitate you. Dr. Swanu Trivedi. <laughs> Professor Priyoranjan Chamba. Thank, thank you all for being on this conversation. And now I would like to hand over the mic to Professor Bhaganoyanam so that we can begin the deep talk. Thank you, Yorimba. I, I hope I'm audible clearly. So on behalf of uh, Delhi Manipuri Society, let me once again welcome Professor Manoj Pant. I think he was our Dean School of International Studies when I was newly joining uh, the Special Center for the Study of Northeast India and taking help guidance from him up to now. Uh, we are extremely grateful that you have in spite of busy schedule, I was not expecting you to say yes so easily, but it was so kind of you that you have agreed. And also Dr. Sonu Tribediji, I mean, who had been there uh, associated with us in one way or the other for quite some time and looking forward a lot more from you today. And of course, our own Oza Priyoranjan, uh, he never retires. That is how students keep uh, his own student turned teachers won't let him retire even after retirement whether with payment or without payment he has to attend the classes and keep teaching that's how it is and our own present chief minister also is not leaving him so freely so he has to be constantly being engaged in many decision making so what we thought of doing is uh, let me uh, bring it in front of all the audience here uh, mostly member of Delhi Manipur Society and also others who have come here. Uh, really warm welcome to all of you and really, really thanks, grateful to, for your presence here. 
uh, you know that last 10, 11 months is a terrible, terrible time. Even this word that I'm uttering should not have been uttered. But then this is how things are, the existential predicaments. You, you are sitting here, your member has said that somewhere you are existentially located out in Manipur. You cannot run away from there. You're emotively inclined. But then there is a need to come out and see that this crisis that we are seeing for the last 10, 11 months still going on. It is not the, the matter that we have to look. This is only a passing phase, I believe. There are larger, deeper issues, more serious in matter on the issues of development. How Manipur has to look for itself, gear for itself in the larger framework of Government of India's policy, which not only is thinking about developing the Northeast, but also say, not only looking, but at conflict. Those are important part. You need peace, you need order, you need harmony. But the very basis of on which we all stand comfortably is the economic development and the self-sustenance. That is what is most important. And Myanmar was not even a part of it, and that is how we have to look for it. But the crisis, you know, which is there in Myanmar for quite some time now, to control some of the territory in the entire north east north northwest and the southwest of myanmar if you look at right from chan province to karen the kachin sagong sagang and then chin and down to rakhine and you see that entire corner of the entire what you call north east and turning it anti-clockwise to the Rakhine is a troubled state. And within, within this, how do we locate ourselves? How is India's policy going to work out? And for us, a small state like Manipur, where do we stand? And it is within this perspective, we have three of the best minds we could think of. Of course, there are many, many great minds in this great city of Delhi, but we thought of three of them. And the pro Professor Pant, who has been associated right from the inception, vision document of Northeast Locust policy. So we will be hearing from him, government of India's policy and so on. And the constraints that India has and the Northeast has vis-a-vis -vis this international relationship, particularly Myanmar. Bangladesh is relatively so who will be able to tell us better doing much better but myanmar is a big big problem and that percolates into manipur recent 10 11 months of violence is nothing but a larger repercussion of what is happening in myanmar a big big game that is beyond our imagination and lastly i am expecting professor priranjan to see that these policies within this international scenario where does north is really is where is it located? And particularly, more specifically, what is the place of Manipur? What is the role of Manipur? Are we only a pawn in the entire international trade and politics? Do we have any existence? Do we have a say? Do we have to fend for ourselves? I keep telling, sir, with this, I will finish. When, you know, when I came here in Delhi in 2004, 5, and 10, in that time, this flyover which passes from Terminal 1 to Dwarka, in between are some villages, which you can also call a slum. You need fast movement, fast pace of movement of transportation. You cannot break those villages. You cannot displace those people. So what the government policy is, you have a huge breeze over the villages and you have a smooth drive from airport to the Dwarka. Is North is going to be like that? I keep asking to myself. This is a metaphor. But I think 
there is a point in which I am ex expressing my anxiety. In what way is North is going to contribute in this activist policy? And with this posers and question from a layman like me, we are expecting the experts to share. So what I'm suggesting is we have around 50, first one hour, uh, say 15 to 20 minutes, it's on one of you speak. Uh, that comes to 60 minutes, one hour, then the question answer, then you can have longer answers to follow. It's all up to you, sir. I'm only a timekeeper. Now sure. my job is over. So either you choose the uh, table or dais, whichever way. So, sir, will you begin with Professor Pant? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Bhagat. And uh, uh, it's the first time I'm speaking on the issue of Manipur, at least in Delhi. And my relationship with the Northeast began way back in 98 when the then Chief Minister of Nagaland, Mr. Jabir, invited me there and said, look, we're just starting peace process. In terms of economics, we don't know what we should do. And no mainstream economists willing to come to Nagaland. It's not surprising, right? And I recall my first visit when I stayed at the Japfu Hotel. Those of you go from Manipur to Nagaland, we know that at the Mao Gate. And I was the only resident of the whole hotel. And it was an extremely scary uh, situation. But it turns out that the driver of one of the cars explained to me that what are you so worried about? The fight is not with you. The fight is the government of India. So you are an outsider. He is, you know, the terrorists, what do you call them, have nothing to do with you as such. It's a very interesting view I got. And then the second thing I will mention, what Bhagati just mentioned about the road from Dwarka to, uh, uh, to, to, you know, Gurgaon and bypassing the villages. And I recall a seminar in the Northeast, I think it was in Mizram, way back in 2008 or 9, when the activist policy was being discussed. And after hearing the whole thing, when people talk about what we are doing, and they were listening to us because we were the guys who wrote the vision document still there, they asked me a very simple question. What does this have to do with us? Precisely the problem. The idea of feeling was <coughs> that the Northeast would act as a connect in trade relationships between India and the you know, South Asian states. It's a very important part, by the way, of India's rookies policy that we now call Act East was this. It's also a part of India's political links with the East, states, East and South Asian countries. And they asked me a very simple question. But if you want to trade with South Asia, you don't need to go come through to, through Nagaland, uh, through uh, uh, Northeast. You can bypass us. And I said that's true. After all, if I send a bicycle from India to uh, Middle East, I don't have to go through Pakistan, do I? So they were right. What's in it? And I said, look, the idea, as far as I'm aware, at the time we were right, the right thing was. If those of you read the vision document to say that we said there's only one thing the government of India can do. The government, uh, two things. One is they have to create connectivity because the worst problem in Northeast is connectivity. And this is not air connectivity. I see a lot being heard about airports. So what is the percentage of people in Northeast, small property, who actually travel by air? It's good for students and bureaucrats who have to go. It really isn't a method of mass movement. Similarly, and I think is there in the vision document, we said rail may be a good idea. It may work for Manipur, it has a lot of plain areas. But as far as I can make out, they've been trying to get the road going from Divapur to Kohima and then onwards to Myanmar and uh, to uh, More for I don't know how long. But every time we make the road, the hill falls apart. Because the only part of the northeast which is mountain is actually our natural, the rest are hills. They're not that strong, they're all sinking. Incidentally, you might know there's one part of JNU 
the road which goes towards Purvanchi was also sinking. You know? <laughs> I was wondering when one day I'll have to walk across there. So these are sinking hills, and I would love to have the idea of train links to the hill states, capital, Bari, of course, uh, Manipur. But I don't see it's happening. I don't see the engineering works out. I may be wrong. The real way to push it is roads. And the best thing linkage today, which has been established by the government of India, they've done a great job there, is a road from uh, from right from Guwahati via Dimapur, Myanmar, and Nagaland to, uh, to Manipur. That is the most important road. Now, here is where the problem comes. If you talk, or talk about roads, then what is the first thing we understand? And I'm assuming that development cannot work in the basis of government alone. It never has, it never will be. There has to be a private sector with a local outside or a mixture of the two, which makes the state move. No state works on the basis of government creating jobs. And the only problem which everyone would tell us is that, you know, the issue is what is the security that I'm going to get across at one time to Nagaland? And I felt that the, to me, the location of the Northeast, particularly Myanmar, which is locked in by uh, Manipur is locked in by Myanmar on one side and then Nagaland on the other side, Meghalaya on one side, that's it. If there's any I still recall the days when if any activity was to be stopped in my in in uh, Manipur, all they have to do is close the Mao gate. And that's it. No road will move up and down. They keep standing at the border and looking at each other. Now that situation I used to say way back in 2008, look for alternative routes. Why? Because look at the economics. In 91, Manipur was the richest state in Northeast. By 2004, it is the poorest state in Northeast and going progressively downhill. Mizoram, which was in very bad shape, is stood as the richest state in Northeast and rivals Sikkim in terms of per capita income and development. So it doesn't make sense, right? A poor state cannot become, a uh, rich state cannot become poor overnight. Nor can a poor state become rich or that takes time. And the purpose, of course, is who is going to invest in, Man in Manipur, given the insurgencies, movements from Assam, then, of course, the Mizo one is settled those moments, and the Nagaland movement. Now, the Nagaland P uh, uh, insurgency, unfortunately, affects Myanmar directly through the NSCNK, whose base is Myanmar, and would literally operate in the Mon and areas of uh, which are very close to this. Now, the answer is not to separate the two, which is what the government seems to think. The idea is not to separate by putting a fence. When I was asked about this idea of fencing, I said, it doesn't help. They'll break it down. What are you going to do? No one implemented. There'll be a hole in the fence. People walk across it. Today, if you look at the data for education, I think Bhagat, someone mentioned, I think he mentioned, if you look at the data for education sector in many of the states, including uh, uh, Nagaland and Mizoram, you'll find the gross enrollment ratio of schools is 120%, 115%. How can it be? Actually, the guys in Myanmar who are neighboring, they are actually in those areas. There's well known roads, simple roads, like the road you cross from here to go to Habitat Center. Simple road. They come in the morning, they attend the schools, then they go to the district uh, primary health center to check what's happening. They play football with people, whoever they are, and they go back in the evening. They don't even know they are not a part of. So you cannot stop these activities and stopping these activities will create greater problems in the long run than the short run. So what is the answer? To me, the answer does not lie, unfortunately, only in Manipur. Please remember, Manipur was linked to the rest of the country much, much, much earlier than any of the Northeast states because of the well-known Western movement from Arunachal down to Sin. Yet why is it the most isolated? And I'm not even going to go into the unfortunately political quagmire of the sitting in Delhi and hearing this first issue of this conflagration start in Manipur over the reservation, the Westies, and then suddenly I hear it's gone out of control. I could not understand how a little thing like that, you can later blame it on the other states. 
everyone will put their finger where there is a fire. If there is a fire, someone will help to stoke the fire. But what started the fire? The incident is something which in my mind could have been sorted in 10 minutes. It had nothing to do with the religion. It had nothing to do with reservation. It had to do only with one thing, and that's land. The whole problem of fighting over land in all these areas, whether it is the Ukul uh, Nagas or the Kukis or the Metis, is everyone needs land because that's the only thing they have. There is no economic activity. The only wealth of people is the land. So the Metis wanted to get into that area of the hills, which is, and the Kukis said that the Ukul guys say, don't come up. And the Meti chap said, don't come down to where the hell do we go? And the only way we go is through reservations out of Manipur, which is ST reservation. If that is also reduced, then where do I go? It is all about economics. It is not about any religion. It's not about any ethnic society at all. But today there are people who will play with fire, right? People there, you create a confederation, someone will raise it. And then, so I believe really no point going back to one year. I mean, I think it was badly handled then. I believe she should never have got to this point, as Bhagat is saying. But to the extent that we're here, what do we do? I believe an economic British Creek in North is the only answer. We have said it consistently in our vision document. They have done the first part, and I must compliment the present government. They have done a tremendous job of establishing economic uh, connectivity in the Northeast. If you read the vision document, it always says the biggest problem is connectivity. And I'm talking about road connectivity. It is not by air or by train. That is not what limits movement of people here. I also come to the area. I come to Uttarakhand. Who goes by train? We only go up to Haldwani, and by then is road. How many airports are there in Uttarakhand? Two? Not even two, I think. Only one now. And that's what's in Jolika. So that is not the connectivity I'm talking about. People connectivity only happens through roads. And the government did a very good thing by taking over most of the state capital roads as part of the central plan. Because you make it part of the district plan, then all the money gets eaten up. We don't, won't go into that area. So they did a tremendous job of creating the connectivity. I have seen... I used to tell my friend, I used to go to Nagaland or to Mizoram that I, in my lifetime will I ever get to go from Divapur to uh, Manipur in three, four hours? And I said, never. And I believe it can be done. But for some reason, that fire is gone. The fire that was there three years back, enormous growth in road connectivity for some reason, I don't know why, is gone. So, but it is still there. The connectivity situation in the Northeast today is better than I've ever seen between, let's say, 1992, 98, 99, and 2014, 15, or whatever. So, really good. But that's not enough. At the heart of it is the insurgency issue, whether you like it or not. And there was a start which in Nagaland, unfortunately, are the are the root of the problem of all Northeast, if you want to say. Because right in the center, you're not going to solve the borderland problem without them. You're not going to solve the Manipur problem without them. The, unfortunately, Mizo problem is settled, and that looks like that's getting unsettled too. So these are very worrisome things because we are in a very dangerous area where, I'll just take five minutes more, in a very dangerous area where, for example, Myanmar, I know how far you're aware, the northwest part of Myanmar, and actually I'm sure Manipur, I have not seen any excavations, is full of diamond mines, full of diamond mines. <laughs> and the Chinese have now been there for the last at least six to eight years, as far as I'm aware. Diamond mining is very commonly done, but for some reason we've never even thought about it. We were happy with this silly little informal trade, as you mentioned in Moray which is not going anywhere. I have seen that. I have seen Moray Gate and I found that more people go on the side of the gate from the main gate. Well, really, what's the point? But the, the actual action on the ground is not Moray. There are many similar trade routes between the Myanmar area and the states, which are not the formal routes. They don't like the formal routes. They don't understand the formal routes. They are difficult terrain. They are not the terrain that you normally walk across. And they are not used to it. So, why Myanmar Indian trade has gone on and has not been able to expand much more than it should? With every single, as far as I'm aware, the what you call them, the rivers now, 
every single rebel from north, from myanmar in the eastern part is in a whole day in the morning they are in one of the states mizoram uh, nagaland or something or uh, manipur because they all share borders and then they go back in the evening it's a way of life so the question is how can we make this way of life part of it and the beginning is unless you improve unless you end the security and i'm going to keep coming back to that economics doesn't work without insecurity let me be very clear the first principle we know is law and order is the primary for primary responsible primary factor behind a stable economic system without that there is no economic system at the bigger national level it would pay india enormously to have open trade with china but the security level we cannot do it so no point going to that route and wasting time so we are looking and say but that is true act east and lookies before them was how do i create wealth in the myanmar through going to asean route now the myanmar route is not probably the best route because at the time of creating the act east policy and the asean also when asean was created 2005 the idea was that asean would sort of sort out to myanmar they sort out the internal dissensions and get something i believe that the military uh, regime in myanmar was not too unstable as far as the economic regime in india was concerned it was actually fairly decent as far as the economic regime now how do i solve the problem i believe you have to make northeast and manipur as the fulcrum of economic interest in myanmar people in northeast don't separate them bring them in that's the best thing to do you can't keep them The, the ethnic and something lines or such you can try whatever you want but the whole indian army is not going to work i know i've seen it but how to solve that the first problem to solve is the naga problem now the government of india did a wonderful thing which the previous government postponed for 15 years they kept postponing the uh, nagaland problem by saying meeting over here saying we don't agree with this we don't agree no sovereignty is out of the pit table okay you go back we go back peace for one more year they bought peace by saying no action i think i was so impressed when the new government came and the first thing uh, which was said was look no more no more trade off let's settle for peace one way or the other either we do it through fighting or we do it for peace whichever way and that was a great move and i do believe i thought that the insurgency issue in nagaland was a trade end and the framework agreement signed in 2015 uh, the joke in nagaland is it will work now without the two of them one has died and the other guy doesn't have his heart in the matter anymore so he wants to sign something or to go no, but it's just faltered we are in 23 four i think three or four hornbill festivals apart past when i've heard that central government is going to come to announce the take off of the framework but it has not happened and as a consequence the eastern part of nagaland those who are linked to the nsc and k that is those in the mon area have the what are called eastern east uh, eastern nagaland people's front now say we want to leave nagaland forget about the other people so fissipedia tendencies are emerging even within nagaland and this had begun way back in 10000 uh, 2010 11 but is getting worse and what worries me is the economically backward but politically stable myanmar is not there anymore it is not still economically backward and politically unstable which is very new you never heard of this but the politically back uh, unstable government which was there in nagaland is now politically stable but economically unstable they have no way that they are going so how do i solve the problem i do believe you have to bring the naga problem to an end one way or the other is lingering on too long and then those who are going are getting linked to there by the way i have found myself through extensive traveling at least to uh, manipur uh, to nagaland and uh, mizoram that there is no ground support for extremism let me tell you you know no there no no one supports the extremists on the ground from what i have seen compared to 2000 2001 but when everyone serves every extremist group survival is at stake they all get together and that's what worries me so i believe an economic briskree it will have to be followed by the state government actually getting in 
and putting in people on the ground. Let me show you one thing. Try to understand these popular Northeast are very small. Someone will tell you their popular thing will end. They all lying. They all raise their population in order to get more delimitation of states. Mizoram is very stable. Nagaland is getting there, but very small populations. How long does it take to settle an area of 2 million people? I can think of three things you do. Two crops, one limited tourism, you are through. Examples, Sikkim. What is there? They've got the army who buys all their stuff. The army is enough to, so you know, how six lakh people, four lakh people, how much is the problem? It's like last but another one half. How long, do, why can't you settle it? And at the root of it is the problem of, and I'm going to end with that, I believe the extremism in Nagaland, which is their undercurrent, is going to extend elsewhere, and will stop it. The Manipur, whatever's gone is, go, is over, but you have to get back to it now and say, let's settle the whole Northeast problem together. You can't say, I'll solve Sikkim today, tomorrow, do Nagaland. Okay, if Islam is settled, they'll start something. It doesn't work like that. I don't think some of the uh, steps they're taking in terms of the Northeast states, in terms of border areas, are the right steps at this time. I don't think that is necessary or able to solve the problem. Now, how do I do it? It's fairly simple. The idea is, let's push trade. And there's one factor which we have, which helps now. You know that India has signed the trade frustration agreement in the in the WTO, which says any Nepalese guy who wants to send his trade to Bangladesh, the Indian have to give them transit. If they cannot, what happens right now is the you get off their truck, get into Indian truck, get off, the, not anymore. You specify your conditions, but the TF requirement at the WTO, which India signed, says that traders in Nepal have to be in access to trade to, uh, the north, to the beyond the Northeast. So let the Northeast develop a logistic center. Now, don't think it's such a small thing. Not only a question of small mechanics. The whole of Noida is developing a logistic center because of the international airport, nothing else. There's nothing there. Take away the Jaiwal Airport, end of Noida. I live there by the now. It's the end of Noida. At the end of Noida. Just develop Northeast here and uh, as a logistics center. The big guys will come. But only the big guys look at trade through airports. They will come, they'll establish facilities and let it happen. But for the first thing to do, again, I'm going to say it, please solve the Northeast. Please solve the insurgency problem. And this will never be handled politically or, and I can guarantee it, by attrition. Attrition will never work in Northeast. Thank you. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> before. Um, as uh, we have already seen, Professor Bhagat uh, has given an overview uh, of the topic that we are going to discuss today. And Professor Pant has uh, uh, already, um, um, uh, he has already kick-started the um, uh, conversation with focusing on the need for economic development. Myself, uh, as somebody who is doing research on activist uh, policy, the Lukist policy and the activist policy now, would be focusing on the uh, geopolitical importance of the northeastern region and uh, its importance and centrality to the activist policy and it's also uh, the linkages with the ASEAN region. But before I begin, I would like to first uh, first of all thank the Manipur Manipuri Society, uh, the president, Professor Oinam Bhagat, and Mutum Oiram, uh, the joint secretary, for this kind invitation. And I would also like to congratulate them for organizing this uh, very important dialogue uh, and for mainstreaming uh, the voices of the Northeast here and uh, focusing on the importance of the Northeastern region uh, to the activist policy and also uh, how important. Uh, is the issue of economic development for um, uh, for peace and reconciliation in the region. So congratulations, uh, Professor Bhagat and the entire Manipur Society, all the members who are present here today for organizing this very important talk today. 
uh, so far as uh, since the, it is an informed audience, I will not uh, go into the background of the northeastern region. But uh, just uh, out, uh, just I would like to begin with the strategic importance of uh, this region as it shares more than 5,000 kilometers of long international boundaries with five uh, neighboring countries, that is Bangladesh, Bhutan, <coughs> Nepal, um, Myanmar, and China. And uh, actually, it is because of this um, reason that um, uh, the, the entire uh, Northeastern region has acquired <coughs> geopolitical importance because of the geopolitical rivalry that is going on in the entire Indo-Pacific region. And since uh, uh, the Northeast region cannot be isolated from uh, its external neighborhood, therefore lies the relevance of looking and acting East at the neighboring countries, that is Bangladesh, Myanmar, Nepal, Bhutan, and China. Uh, one of the issues uh, that lies at the background is the poor connectivity, as Professor Pant has also, also pointed on this fact. The poor connectivity of the northeastern region with India and its perceived isolation has also led to the vulnerability uh, of this region to issues such as terrorism, ethnic conflicts, and uh, all this has given boost to frequent insurgencies. And as we are all aware, how uh, uh, the internal dynamics of the region has also led to the demand for identity and autonomy, resulting in insurgency involving separate, uh, multiple separatist milit militant groups, uh, which is an outcome of the centuries-old reconstruction of boundaries in the Indian subcontinent uh, right from the colonial times and even before that. And uh, the other uh, major uh, internal issue um, which has led to the uh, underdevelopment and, and why we are talking about uh, the economic development and its linkages uh, with the Act East policy and the ASEAN is the delivery deficit and the poor, uh, um, and the poor, uh, you can say, the bureaucracy, uh, uh, the uh, regulatory challenges that we have, which has uh, resulted into uh, the, uh, you can say, uh, the entire uh, uh, delivery deficit has been because of the difficult terrain, the dispersed and the small habitation that, uh, that, that you find in this region, and also because of the low financial viability of the projects and adequate project implementation. I'll be highlighting some of these projects also in the later part of my uh, presentation. And also, uh, uh, the long and international uh, uh, porous borders that we have has also resulted in fragile uh, security situation of the entire northeastern region. Uh, and it is because of this that the entire, uh, 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 we talk about the strategic, uh, um, the strategic importance and the geopolitics that is happening in the region th that has make, made it as one of the, you can say, um, uh, 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 as a major, uh, uh, it has become an important, you can say, um, um, a point for geopolitical rivalry in the region. And uh, when we go back to the history of Actist policy, uh, it was launched uh, in 2014, though it is a continuity of the Lukist policy that we already have. And it embodies a more robust action-oriented approach emphasizing not only on enhanced economic in engagement, but also focusing on deeper cultural and people-to-people -people connections that we have with the Southeast Asian region. This re re reorientation from Lukist to Actist has been driven by India's aspiration to engage as a significant player in the dynamic Indo-Pacific region and to counterbalance China's growing importance. And uh, the region, um, uh, uh, this entire northeastern region has been uh, a very important, uh, you can say, a very important, uh, uh, its significance lies uh, because of the infrastructural uh, uh, projects that we have in the region. So when we talk about the economic development, it is tied with the infrastructural development and Actist policy prioritizes the infrastructural development in the Northeast. And some of these, is in, uh, I'll be highlighting some of the infra uh, infrastructural uh, projects that we have in the region. The one uh, which I would like to highlight is the Indi um, India uh, Myanmar Thailand uh, trilateral highway, though it's a long overdue project. Uh, the project, in fact, was conceived in way back in 2002 and the impl implementation started after 2012. And uh, several components of this 
this uh, project uh, has been completed if we talk about the T uh, TKK road that is Tamu Kale Kaleva road that has been com uh, completed but uh, some of the paths from uh, Yargi Moiva up till uh, Mandalay some paths are still to be completed but uh, when we see uh, the part from Mandalay to Thailand uh, it connects uh, uh, it's conne it connects up to Mesot in Thailand so that part has been completed so these are some of the uh, you can say uh, 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 some of the projects uh, which are uh, which has be, uh, it has been delayed for a long time the another uh, important connectivity project that i wanted to highlight here is uh, the uh, kaladan multimodal uh, uh, transit transport project uh, um, uh, Again, this was conceived way back in 2008, but, uh, though the project was completed by 2018 or 19, but for the first time, uh, 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 we saw the operationalization of the Sitway port, port last year. So uh, again, uh, the project was delayed for a long time, but still the road component is still not complete. Uh, this uh, Kaladan multimodal uh, transit transport uh, project connects Sitway port uh, to uh, uh, Paleva and from Paleva, Paleva, uh, Sitwe is the seaport, Paleva is the inland port and from Paleva there is a, a land route going up till Zoinpuri and fr uh, from Zoinpuri we see again a connection to Aizwal. So uh, 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 this uh, multimodal uh, transport project, uh, if complete, uh, if it is completed then it would uh, connect uh, the Sitwe port uh, to the Calcutta port and also through Paleva, through northeastern, uh, through through land connectivity, we can see that uh, the uh, this entire landlocked region of northeast could be connected with the southeast Asian region. But along with this, uh, these two major uh, projects, uh, which is linked with uh, our immediate neighbor, which is uh, Myanmar, I would also like to highlight the other uh, connectivity uh, uh, project. Uh, though it is not a project, but the Yelfu uh, uh, special administrative region, which has been declared by Bhutan. Done. Uh, and uh, the linking of uh, this uh, Gelfu with uh, the railway line, which is from Kokrajhar um, in Assam to Gelfu region. So that is also linking the northeastern region fr from Kokrajhar towards Bhutan. And uh, the other important, uh, very important uh, port, which has been recently um, um, handed over um, um, uh, by the Prime Minister, is the Sabroom port in Tripura. So this is also uh, uh, connecting Sabroon port in Tripura to the Chittagong port. So uh, this would also uh, increase the connectivity of the landlocked uh, region of northeastern, uh, uh, the entire northeastern states to the uh, Chittagong port. And uh, the other again important port uh, in Meghalaya is the Doki port, which is also being developed. And uh, the idea is to uh, develop the industrial corridor uh, with the help of Japan. In fact, uh, Japan is uh, um, um, uh, developing the Matabari port. And from Matabari port, uh, uh, the uh, goods could be uh, carried up to the uh, to the Doki port. And from there, it could be connected to Shillong, Guwahati, Dimapur, Imphal, Mori, and then from Mori, it would further move to the Southeast Asia region. So, uh, 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 this Matabari port, which is being uh, in, in Bangladesh, which is being developed with the help of Japan, is a part of this uh, connectivity corridor and it comes under the industrial, um, uh, uh, the Bay of Bengal uh, industrial uh, development corridor, which is being developed by uh, uh, Japan, which, which would connect the regions, the entire BBIN network, that is uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal. So all this will be connected to the northeastern region. So the idea is to develop this developmental corridor. <coughs> and not only this, but also uh, uh, I would also like to uh, uh, highlight some of the other developmental projects uh, which would uh, cater to the needs of the local markets, like the local hearts with emphasis on agriculture, horticulture hand looms, handicrafts, processed goods. If uh, these local hearts could be developed at the border point at Mori and Tamu, though it is now disturbed region. So uh, first we have to talk about uh, the peace and reconciliation and uh, then uh, opening up these uh, border hearts. But then uh, what, what should, uh, in fact, economic, uh, had there been economic development earlier, then we would have not faced the problem that we are having now. So, uh, but presently uh, the, uh, the main idea is to work for peace and reconciliation recon and then uh, talk about establishing these border hearts at the border points like Moritamu, Zokatari, Avakung, Pansat, and Nampong and Pangsao Pass in Arunachal. So uh, 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 in all the bordering states, uh, uh, 
in the northeastern region that we have with Myanmar and also fulfilling the development aspirations of the people in the border region by enhancing border area development projects and uh, some of the border area development projects that we have with Myanmar I would like to highlight them like the cardamom plants the small schools that are being developed so these are small uh, projects that could be uh, uh, developed um, in uh, close uh, consultation with the neighboring countries and and the states which are there in the north northeastern region rather than talking about the big special economic zones and big uh, mega connectivity projects but these small border hearts and uh, uh, small uh, capacity development programs if it could be developed further that would help in uh, trade facilitation and investment in the border region and uh, <clears throat> that is why uh, when we talk about the economic development and trade and investment, uh, we have to focus on these border trade agreements, uh, like uh, various border trade agreements and initiatives that are being carried out in the region that would help in further uh, development of the region. <clears throat> Along with this, uh, uh, along with the connectivity and uh, the trade and investment uh, related issues, uh, the region is also important as has been already highlighted uh, because of uh, the cultural exchange, the people to people contact that we have between the two regions since centuries. And uh, uh, even now, uh, we are have uh, we are uh, engaging with this uh, with the region where we are organizing various um, uh, programs for uh, educational collaboration, youth exchange, ASEAN India Youth Dialogue is being conducted. Then ASEAN India Think Tank meets, University Connect programs are being uh, organized, and uh, you have academic collaborations uh, uh, under the Act East and uh, Act East policy and Northeastern region, and all. These are aiming at enhancing human capital development. And uh, the strategic importance of the region I have already highlighted. Uh, and this has led to security cooperation in the, uh, in the entire region. The enhanced connectivity and diplomatic engagement under activist policy contributes to regional stability and security. The collaborative efforts in counterterrorism maritime security, border management, uh, strengthen India's ties with neighboring countries and safeguards its interest in the Northeast. We've seen uh, joint programs, uh, military exchanges also happening and defense cooperation related uh, programs being um, organized uh, in the entire, uh, like uh, uh, with, uh, that comes under the broader rubric of our Act East policy. And that has led to a greater uh, political and diplom uh, diplomatic outreach uh, of India's northeastern region with the, uh, um, with the ASEAN countries. <coughs> So uh, these are some of the points uh, which talks about the significance of the Northeastern region for the Actist policy. Now I would be highlighting some of the challenges despite the transformative potential of Actist policy, several challenges persist include, uh, and these include uh, some of the infrastructural challenges related to the infrastructural projects that we have. There are trade imbalances, there are regulatory barriers along with the socio-economic disparities and the ethnic conflicts that we have in the region. So addressing these challenges require sustained political will, institutional reforms and grassroots participation. Moreover, inclusive development strategies that prioritize the socio-economic empowerment of local communities are also imperative for ensuring the equitable distribution of benefits from Act East policy. So uh, 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 while from, uh, uh, when we are talking about mainstreaming the North, uh, like no Northeast lies at the center of our Act East policy. So we have to talk about uh, in our policy challenges uh, and the policy decisions that we are taking, we have to talk about the trade imbalances, the infrastructural uh, deficits that we have, connectivity constraints that we have, the regulatory ba barriers, along with the socioeconomic disparities in the northeastern region needs to be highlighted and uh, the economic and developmental challenges facing the implementation of the act east policy uh, could result in uh, if, if, uh, these would result in missed opportunities if the economic growth and the socioeconomic disparities that has been per perpetuating the regional backwardness ne uh, these needs to be highlighted by addressing these challenges such as uh, the infrastructural deficit, regulatory barriers, trade imbalances, inclusive development of the region. Uh, all these 
would help in fostering peace and stability of the region. And the Northeast India can leverage the activist policy to unblock its economic potential and achieve sustainable development and emerge as a vibrant economic hub and gateway to Southeast Asia. I would end here. Thank you. Punch, uh, very candidly, firmly stating that trade route by road is the only viable way to look into. Because, you know, this why I say this is often when there is a conflict or where is a blockade, we think the government of India will bring some aircrafts and people can just move out. But that may be possible for people moving out of a conflict zone. But when there is a stability that we expect and the trade quantum has to be heavy, there is no other way than the road. But, sir, you must be also knowing government of India, how true, I do not know, has constructed the tallest railway lines in the entire world in North East. This is in Tamenglong and this, this area. But how long is it going to be feasible with the insurgency that is coming? It is, yeah, from Tamenglong, Manipur side to Silsar to the Assam side, they are this road. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, that keeping aside this point, which is very important, is the trade route, the roadways, the connectivity, which Sonu has again highlighted that it is so important for connecting the entire region with the five uh, countries that you have said. But to me, uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar are major players because I think Japan is also thinking of free trade zone making this area, including Myanmar. So everybody is eyeing this region and they have their own ways. I was also expecting you because in, on 15th, that is yesterday, Hindustan Times, they have said Rakhine, there is a huge crisis coming up and this whole corridor that you are thinking of uh, is in a jeopardized and how, how successful it is going to be. India is really in a topsy-turvy situation. But then another point which you did flag off, this is not the right place, but I'm still, I'm flagging off, but please don't raise this point. Only let the chair raise it. We will take it for another meeting is he says, all this problem comes from Naga in certain issues. And perhaps there is a point, I don't know. I may be absolutely wrong. Let God prove that I'm wrong. And that is the whole crisis that you are seeing today in Manipur has it to do with settling the Naga issue. All issues in Manipur at the one, but this is only with a full stop right there, nothing more. But taking it from what Hero has presented, I was thinking I should have, uh, you know, he spoke in Manipuri also. I should have spoken before uh, you began. Uh, we wanted his prelude primarily because we talk about Atlas policy and all great grand narratives policy framework. But after all, how is it, how is it going to impact, benefit the people? And people means not only the buyers, but small time entrepreneurs. If it is not going to help, what is that policy all about? If it is for the big players, as you have said, sir, and if it is not going to benefit the local entrepreneurs, what is your policy all about? Is that about welfare state? So the question that uh, Hiro was raising is, when there was a time prior to 2017, lots of goods were moving from the mainland to the chicken neck, through Mian, uh, sorry, through Manipur, More, and they could even sell it to the Burmese side. Of course, this is perhaps illegal, but then still you could do this. But then suddenly after 2017, the Indian goods are coming from Myanmar side to the Imphal. So this is another, because that means there is an opening of new trade routes through the sea, and there is a competition going on. So traders, Indian traders, one sending through the land route towards Myanmar, another is sending through the sea route 
from Myanmar towards the Northeast. So it, it becomes a very complicated uh, situation. Perhaps you may have to think about it. Uh, and uh, another point was in 2007-8 was I was part of a team. Uh, it has Institute of Developing Economy in Japan from Kyoto. Uh, Sanjoy Hazarika and uh, uh, Morama, I'm forgetting the full name, they have edited the volume. One chapter I have. LIC presents Jeevan Utsa, Get Life Insurance. Manipur coming from Punjab to the Myanmar side, rice, black rice, white rice coming from Myanmar side to Manipur. So this trade transaction was going on. Suddenly with formalization of trade, you have listed around seven, eight or 10, Uza knows better. I'm just flagging up so that you take this up as well. Suddenly you find some of them have become smuggler or illegal traders because those trade which you had been following for quite some time, for hundred, uh, not hundred, at least few decades you had been doing it. Suddenly that listing of the formalization does not include rice, does not include cycle. So you ended up suddenly one day becoming a smuggler because you are, you can be penalized. So there is always a, you know, uh, what name you give to the traders is in this process of formalization. So once you add those items, then it is a formal trade. If you don't add that time, then that you do smuggling. Of course, drugs cannot be listed in that, you know, cocaine and the heroines cannot be listed, but cycles and the rice, this can also be paddy, then can be done. But this is a very layman's observation. But uh, taking up from him, I'm requesting Oza to really look into how uh, North is, is responding to this act is policy, and particularly for the state of Manipur. Uja, over to you. Yeah. Professor Bhagat, uh, my colleagues over here, and ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, I would like to thank Bhagat for, for inviting me for the second time. The first time was two or three years back. He invited me to give a memorial lecture uh, at JNU, and it had to do with uh, an, a, in the Azaktis policy. And this is now the second time that he's inviting me on the same thing. Uh, now, act is policy, look is policy. There are substantial differences between these, between these two things which indicates India government's changing foreign policy, number one. India government's changing foreign policy, that is why Bhagat had raised the issue of how do you locate Manipur and the Northeast in India's foreign policy changes. This is the main thing. No, Lucas policy, uh, I mean, act is policy has failed. Uh, sorry, look is policy had failed. Act is policy is yet to take off, isn't it? These are realities. So the issue before us is why has it failed? How can we make it work? Who is responsible? These are vital issues that we have to address. So how do we locate Manipur and uh, Northeast in India's larger foreign policy uh, initiatives? The other vital question which Bhagat had raised is, what is the contribution of Northeast to India's larger foreign policy and uh, economic development drives for the Northeastern region? It's a matter of responsibility. Is it the state governments? Is it donor or NEC who are responsible institutions for the failure of the Akis and Lucas policy and now none starting off this thing? Who are, who are responsible? How have 
the states of the Northeast reacted to this vital India government policy, you know, look is to act this, who's responsible? How really interested are the governments of the Northeast? Is there some interested? Yes, they have a special cell and a secretary in charge, some civil service boy in charge of this policy, even if they have no trade with Myanmar. Okay. Uh, is Mizoram interested? Yes, they have a, uh, the uh, trading center there. Is Manipur interested? Manipur government interested? In what sense has it shown its interest? To that. So all states, Anurachal Pradesh, Mizoram, on some, none of the governments of the region are seriously interested in this. Why? Because of what uh, Professor had said, the security reasons. When I go to my chief minister and tell him, look, these uh, Myanmar is, uh, people are coming, these university people are coming, we are going to discuss this and that, you do something, we want you to do this, Northeastern people are say, telling him, I mean, that is, uh, trade is happening in Manipur only, isn't it? That's, he tells me that the security problem, unless this uh, security problem is there, what can I do? A sense of resignation is there in where things are happening in Manipur, right? Mizoram, they are doing nothing. They let everything informal. It's still going on, Manipur stock. So who's responsible? So governments are partly responsible. Number two, uh, then who are the actors? The actors are the businessmen like him. See that? So they are not responding to the extent that higher order traders are generated <coughs> who can trade across in formal ways. 20 years of Lucas policy and the border trade agreement did not generate formal higher order international traders. Why? So they are also responsible. What about the government of India? In its shift from Lucas policy to, to Actis policy, see, did the government of India think soundly enough? Did it examine why the Lucas policy and uh, Actis pol uh, Lucas policy and the border trade agreement, which lasted for 20 years, did they examine why it failed? Why it was not able to generate the higher order traders? Did it re-examine the border trade agreement? Was the border trade agreement implemented in spirit? In reality, no. <coughs> Government of India withdrew the border trade agreement unilaterally. And what the Myanmar government said? All the newspapers in Myanmar, India government has betrayed us. Our border trade, trade with India is finished. Without informing us, they have stopped it. So, you know, so everybody has a pie, finger in the pie called Lucas policy or Actis policy. We have failed collectively. Then, do we not need, do we, uh, do we not need to learn from history? Isn't it? What has changed qualitatively in India's foreign policy? You see, as far as I understand, as far as academics understand it, those who are looking into the look at this or Lucas policy, you see, the Lucas policy was a much more simpler, ASEAN centric foreign policy decision. <coughs> so it wanted to thread with the ASEAN country because of so many geopolitical changes, Cold War, I won't go into that, right? So it was for some trade with ASEAN because Russia was no longer there. Global, globalization, so many things are changing. It was, a, it was necessary. 
number one. Number two, as flagged, security, we have to solve the security problem of insurgency. Threat was minor. Insurgency solving was a major security and strategic concern of the Lucas policy, of the act is policy, Lucas policy. And the Northeastern region being a pivot for India's Lucas policy was of the least priority, number three. As Professor A said, right? Without solving your Naga problem, you cannot have threat. That's what you said. <coughs> without building sufficient logistics and uh, uh, roads and railways and all that, you cannot have thread. Those are the assumptions of vision document 220. Wrong in many ways, right in many ways. Both these rights and wrong has created the problem of the Northeast not being in the serious arc of India's foreign policy decisions. This is one. I'll point out why. You see, so Lucas policy was an innocuous and starting point, but it lasted 20 years. What was the, on the ground, it was that border trade agreement. That was the fulcrum of India's Lucas policy for knowledge. But the problem with that document was that it was never revisited, even though clauses are there, that whenever there is a problem, we'll have bilateral discussions with Myanmar, us, and we'll solve a problem. Never, not even one meeting was held, okay? We had three items. Babit was telling we had a huge argument yesterday. They were saying, you don't take care of the proletariat, should I say, in JNU terminology, or the masses of small traders. We have three parameters in that border trade agreement. One is headlord threat, right? That is for the common people with FMR, you know, move between 40 kilometers without any restriction, zero duty, right? The second one was barter threat with only 5% taxes duties, which is uh, absolutely marginal. The expectation was that this traditional movement of goods, people between Myanmar and the Northeast region will continue non-restrained. We'll not touch that. Number two, but there will be people who would be want, wanting to do thread formally, not through headlots, but through the roads, isn't it? So that is the bartered thread. Okay, so the problem with that barter thread was that the provisions were such that it was impossible. What was the provision? If you send one lakh of exports to Myanmar, you will have to import another one lakh. Nonsense. You want a person, a trader to be both an importer or an exporter. If you can't do that, you will be penalized or even jailed. Okay. Look at the incongruity and nonsense about that. Okay, security reasons, whatever, isn't it? So uh, they tried, they couldn't balance it, <coughs> balancing of trade, which is impossible. And the third was normal threat, which never took place, even after active policy. Okay, so there was a structural flaw in the border trade agreement, which was never corrected. Why? Did the uh, traders themselves come out and say, we need this correction? No, but they did say. The first list consisted of only agricultural items. So there was a huge gap between what was demanded and, and what could be supplied. Mismatch between what people want to trade and what the least government fiat want us to trade. As if Trade and economic development can be dictated. Forget development, but at least trade is something which the government should have no business doing. It's the businessman who should decide, isn't it? So the business people, they form small, small organizations. Uh, they pressurize the government of India. I met 
DGFT, you know, and so many people came. What's your problem? Oh, exchange of dollars. If you want to do it at one rupee, with rupee, rupee exchange like Nepal, but you, you know, so many negotiations, they did say so. It took years for a second list to come out, which included some of the uh, commodities that people wanted to trade. Okay, it was there. And by the third list, there were 62 items where almost all that was being traded in at Moray and at Jakarta were included. But you know what the tragedy was? Those lists, second list and the third list. The second list, by the time it came, and by the time our traders inquired about how to set tube lights, how can I get it from there, and this and this, that, informations never came there <laughs> at Moray. The second list never took off. We were stuck with the first list. Negotiated, negotiated, third list came out in which everything was there. 60% of the trading that is taking place at Moray, which I surveyed, okay, are clothes and footwear. So all sorts of things, uh, you know, are there. Now, so these were included in the third list, but the third list never also reached here even. Okay. So, was the Manipur government interested? No. Was the trader interested? No. Was the India government interested? Slightly, but leave them be. Your security problem. Security ni hoga to naga ke finish karo. Fir hoga abe kuchu proy kuch bhi karne do. Sida idea. We have a finger. Every one of us has a finger in that field. Now, uh, so. In the meantime, 20 years, Nobel Trade coming in 2015, in these 20 years, paradigm shifts have taken place in the culture of trading at Mori. The reason why they did not come out and speak to the government for policy changes. By the very structure of the border trade agreement, <coughs> okay, headlock trade is zero duty, others have 5%. These traders who are small time traders, they could not also uh, upgrade to a formal trader because letter of credit system was not there. Okay. Clearances had to be made through dollar payments. These things were simply not there. The soft infrastructures and institutional mechanisms for that border trade to happen and to you know, promote itself to formal trade was simply not there. So, so she had flagged it, right? So what happened now? On the other hand, you don't want to pay tax at all, even that 5%. So this headlord, which would be only a small basket, turned into four feet long gunny bags, six feet long gunny bags, you will carry, okay? And that, collect them together, you have a truckload. No zero tax, isn't it? So the traders themselves are responsible. And I used to say it, not only our trade unions, but across the border, when I used to go there, I used to tell the Myanmar Chamber of Commerce this and that, you people, you are stabbing yourself. You are shooting yourself on your foot. You have to formalize trade, otherwise at any moment of time, India government is will, okay? say chutti to trade and uh, they don't want smuggling you know so trade became a vehicle for many many illegal things that's the history of it but in your government i mean they didn't uh, they didn't they were dissatisfied their revenues were not coming on the other hand they were not installing the infrastructures and trade facilitation measures that would have helped that trade thing to go ahead. So one fine morning in 2015, India in military withdrew it, and this normal trade was there. But imagine, people here did not know the customs people. People in Myanmar didn't know. Okay, I crossed over and I said there was a Fiki organized uh, con huge conclave at Kohima. So these uh, Burmese came, including their trade leaders, and I told them, look. 
normal traders come. Okay, uh, why are you, uh, 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 you can't do this. Even the customer said, we haven't got the information. Then the notifications have not come to us. And I said, look, this 2015 normal trade, abrogating the border trade, okay, was accompanied by giving Myanmar, which is an underdeveloped country, MNF, you know, um, underdeveloped country, we gave them most favored nation treatment. Out of all the uh, list of, you know, tariff lines, except 113 commodities, which were in the positive list, the other were zero tax. Okay. Why didn't our traders trade in those zero tax items? One question. Even the dons at Mori and in uh, other places of Myanmar, Mandalay, Rangoon, you know, these people didn't know. In fact, the Myanmarese people, just like our Manipuri people, don't and still don't want to trade formally. They became a team so that this formal trade could happen. See that? Now, what about the Myanmar government? They never set up Myanmar Economic Bank, UBI. You know, these never, even now, the credit, this uh, letter of credit mechanism, which is the best mechanism to have formal trade, is not happening. Okay? The chief secretary at that time told me, Professor, you are talking so much. Just give me one guarantee. Just bring me one trader who wants to do LOC. <laughs> I mean, a letter of credit transaction, I will, our government will help. Because at that time, I happen to be a member of that uh, trade committee at the state level. You see? So many things have worked, you know. And at that time, so my point is, look, his policy failed because of structural reasons, policy reasons. But at this policy, <laughs> What is the ACTIS policy and what is the qualitative change in ACTIS policy that has happened? India is, supposed, is now the fifth nation in terms of GDP, supposed to come to third and so on, isn't it? Now, there is deglobalization in the world today, okay? We want not outsourcing, insuring, isn't it? Only those nations which are Close to me, I don't have risks like in China. Okay, that's Trump problem in America threat. So globalization is in a you know in a very precarious position. So India now realized that India first. See that India first. We don't want any bloody more deficit with the Chinese. If I join the RC RCEP with which I already have 105 billion deficits, 550 billion with China. China is part of that huge thing. Okay. I'm having huge deficit, deficit with ASEAN. We are buying your manufactured goods. You are not buying our services, of which we Indians wanted and thought we'd get that. India took a very strong decision that in the Silver Jubilee 25th Delhi Declaration, that was that is India's latest foreign policy decision, which affects us, the Northeast. So what is that? ASEAN wanted this RCEP, okay, Regional Comprehensive Economic, this thing, cooperation thing, to be signed in 2018. Delhi, okay, please do it. India said no. You only want to gain from India, just like Myanmar, just like Bangladesh, just like Nepal, okay? All these people, India give, give, give. China, it's so huge. How many billion uh, dollars, a trillion, it, uh, India is far behind them, 18 trillion or something, isn't it? India is hardly 3.7 or something, isn't it? So now, India had to take a decision. We will hardly negotiate all free trade agreements. We'll negotiate. That's why India threw away our border trade agreement. It's one of the agreements, unilaterally. Myanmar is not responding. 
Okay. We have an ICP being constructed. All the facilities are there. Everything is now there. Okay. If you guys want to do formal threat, it can happen. But it's not there on the other side of the border. India has now promised to make it, right, Manita? India has promised to make it. So they are not reciprocating. So India, you know, our government, yeah, India first, right? So we said, yes, the so-called trees. So what India said? Connectivity. We will build road first. Okay, connectivity, culture, CLMB countries, okay, Lao, Myanmar, this thing. Trade, it didn't even talk of it. That's India's current situation. Any trade, any trade agreement, we will look at India's internal concerns. If you are going to dump third world country goods into India through Myanmar, through Manipur and this thing, we will look into it twice. Not like before, isn't it? So it affected uh, what? Uh, who is affected now? No, no Eastern region, isn't it? It's there. See, we can't do trade now. India doesn't want trade now. Okay. But besides that border trade agreement, forget that normal trade with MNF facilities, okay, concessions. Where is the trade facilitation? Have we done anything about third world country goods? All the things that are coming are coming from Thailand, from Yunnan, from Korea, and even from Japan. These things come through Myan, uh, through Mayawadi Meso, uh, this uh, trade post near Rangoon on the Thailand border. Okay, they come. Myanmar charges only three percent. If it comes to more border, they charge another three percent, only six percent. Let it pass. It's happening. At least what we know, what I knew, what my team knew is that that has not actualized as policy on the ground. Number one. Then on the other hand, at that time, you know, because activist policy had come in, okay. India government, because of that Delhi declaration, wanted to build or to convert the trilateral highway into an economic corridor, right? In fact, and it was to be studied by area, isn't it? It's the think tank of ASEAN. Yeah. Fortunately, uh, RIS, uh, India government financed it, in fact, right? I happen to be a member of that. RIS, you know, Parviz, you know, and, oh, I happen to be at the, time, at the time, you invited me to talk about that. Okay, then how can we turn it into a, this thing? The idea was to turn, to extend the trilateral highway up to Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And it ended, as, as was seen by India, I would say, uh, at Tamu, at More. I said, what? You want to extend it to Malau, then why not extend it to Silchar, <laughs> to Calcutta? Hey, why stop at the border? These are some of the, you know, very hard to understand policy decisions. But at Bangkok, in that area, you know, the area meeting, I raised the issue. Why? 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 There is no logic why you should stop extending it up to More only, extend it to at least Silchar, cross Manipur. If Bangladesh is not agreeable, that we will take it up there or through color, whatever you know <laughs> Bangladesh is also a very hard nut to crack of course India government has now cracked all of them I'll tell you that I was there in Dhaka just a few months ago where SART I think tanks meeting was there I'll, that's another story <coughs> now it's India government's proposal to 
turn the trilateral highway, it's the only route, okay? Only possible route. It's, it's beautifully developed. You see how Manipur became American roads recently before this, when this four-lane road goes to Mumbai. No, everybody was surprised. Hey, Professor, what happened to Manipur? Your roads are so beautiful. Okay? So the thing is, <coughs> did India, did Northeastern region prepare for that value chain and economic networking, economic integration with Southeast Asia. Lucas policy was about integrating Northeast with Asia, network of value chains and production networks, right? Actis, Actis policy has now, India has become, is going to be its power. It's an ambitious one whereby it is expanding into the Indo-Pacific, into Australia and New Zealand, into the Far East. Okay. So there, in this activist policy, it is Asian centrality, not Northeast centrality. Lucas policy is not East centrality. Now, India thinks, oh, no, we'll, the, we want connectivity, we want cultural relations with CLMB countries and all that, and it is Asian centrality. So, North East centrality, Asian centrality, India first. Who is first? Who is first? This has been criticized by everybody around, even Asian fields. Right? You want to use us? You want to use Northeast in our thinking, but where do we locate, as he asked? Where are you locating as Asian? You refuse to be in Asia, RCEP, and yet you say you, you, you want ASEAN to be ASEAN-centric India's global, global foreign policy. What is happening is now in the Indo-Pacific, Growth rates all over the world are below 2%. It's only in the ASEAN where it is 4.7%, India 7%. Look at that. It's the only reason where free trade is still welcome. And yet, India, you don't want to join? India first. So there are so many contradictions where small fries like Manipur or small reasonably backward areas like North Asian region becomes a casualty. I would finally want to say this, as Bhagat had rightly asked, what has Northeast done? What is your responsibility, right? Now, this is something we economists in the Northeast have been talking for 30, 40 years, okay? Uh, professor, you probably know this, Atul Sharma. Atul Sharma, of course. You see that? He and us, through the Northeastern Economic Association, we have been, you know, shouting for 20, 30 years of a common market in the Northeastern region. Let us integrate the economies of the Northeastern region first with value chains, okay? The surplus produce of mandarin oranges from Meghalaya, why does it not come to the fruit processing likla industry in Manipur? Where oranges in Tamil Nadu, which is much more better than Magellan, uh, these oranges have now died out. It has become just small because of many reasons. But Likla is importing orange pulp from Nagaland. Why not surplus oranges from there? So you see that it is a northeastern region where the institutional mechanisms were built by the government of India through the vision document. I'll come to vision document in just five more minutes. These are institutions donor, okay? And this uh, NEC. These are the people who are supposed to get together in the policy framework whereby the Northeastern region at least is integrated. Yes, you needed the uh, road networks and connectivity. It is there. We agree. One of the best things that has happened to Northeast, you have built good, beautiful roads, number one, okay? So this is one, even the train is now reaching up to this place there is this now. Now, so that integration part, that planning part is absolutely not there. 
NEC just distributes money. You just see who is the composition of the NEC staff, the old local people. Yesterday, I found that one of your IRS people have become financial advisor of NEC. I don't know whether a financial advisor is an accountant or a, you know, whatever, whatever. Yeah, it's come out in the newspaper, right? So it's being manned, it's being manned by Northeastern people. Talk to bottom, okay? Then what sort of expertise? What happened to Niti Aayog, which was supposed to be the think tank that would advise all of our states? <laughs> I asked my state people, you guys ask Niti Aayog, because we don't have in enough expertise over here. Let us join. Let the people, the academia of the Northeast, be involved with Niti Ayok, promote us so that we can become our own masters and our own experts. That exactly is the philosophical and recommendation of Vision 2020. What are the recommendations in the Vision 20? We will build infrastructures. We will build capacities, okay? And there will be no lack of funds, crores, hundreds of crores. But the operative part, besides this physical infrastructure building, was, and we will let you grow at your pace. So if you are stupid, you remain stupid, right? If your knowledge, experience, is uh, is a little down below so that your value systems and the institutions that you support when technology comes when these things come your mind does not entertain it if there is no land reforms in the hill regions of in uh, northeast india where there is common property rights no private property rights and you common people are being hoodwinked by your elite and even in Manipur, you know, and you don't want private property rights, okay? And yet, you want to join the global world. You want to produce efficiently. So that mental framework, you know. So what has the India government done? Resign, okay, let's educate you first. How many crores you want for education, for sports, for culture? Okay, good idea. So. <laughs> So who's responsible? My question to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, who are responsible. Let us react. Responsibility, isn't it? The last point is, in spite of the government of India, government of Assam or everybody, the Northeastern region has transformed for the good. There is capital accumulation now. Whatever theory was there, Whatever rent seeking was there, whatever contract money was there, have become capital, illegal or whatever. There is huge capital accumulation, and these are entering into industries, into services. You will see the growth in agriculture in Northeast region is 4.1%, where is this negative in India? You will see, you see, manufacturing growth, factory growth in India, in Northeast region is far ahead. Growth in manufacturing, 3%, North, uh, in, uh, here, um, Northeastern region, India, 1%. You see that? Look at vegetable, uh, fruits. India has become stagnant. It's, in Northeastern region, it's going at 3%. Look at fruits, vegetables. There is dynamism. Multinational corporations are now moving to Sikkim, into Meghalaya, into Assam. Right? And our own. And one of the silver linings of this interest problem was local capital formation, number one. And local people have taken over, not by policy, but by default. Because of the incident, people have flown. You have to come in, right? So by default, you have become in Manipur now today. All the big traders have become now agents, huge dealers. Legitimate dealers, so that in a in a very funny way, you know, it has had its the tragedy has had its own silver linings. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. 
uh, Bhagat impacted in that memorial lecture and all the people, the old professor. Professor, you come again and talk to, give us some lectures. No, you continue. I said, no, I'll come next time, of course. And I'm not going to join you, but at least I have this opportunity to address the Manipur elite in Delhi. As much as you are involved with the present crisis, get involved with economics. Insurgency has driven everything away. No concern on economics, okay? Autonomy, identity, that is more important. I don't care whether you survive. That sort of mental framework and value systems have to be suppressed and have to be innovatively adopted to India's security concerns, to the Northeast growth concerns. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, before I throw it as a wonderful uh, eye-opening discussion, before I open it to the audience, sir, would you like to just intervene and uh, give some, that would be good, the discussion among you first, yep. first round, then we, I open it. Yeah, just a few points. I enjoyed that uh, very frank discussion. Yeah. I was trying not to be too frank about these things. You were more diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you about the Northeast, uh, Look East policy, or at least you call it now. First point, you're right. The Lukis policy actually goes back to 91. It had nothing to do with Northeast. It was about improving India's trade relations with, North, with the South Asian countries and further. And then suddenly this Northeast is born, so someone said, well, let's put them also into the mix. So, the, but people didn't know how do we bring them to the mix. That's where we, so he's right about that. Now, <coughs> this whole business, which we also talked about extensively, I think in the vision of, if I remember right, sometime now, Connectivity. Connectivity is was is just a supply side issue, right? There's also demand side to economics. You don't just, you know, make hearts meet. You don't tell the hearts to meet and not let do something, right? So connectivity was the first step, which has been a very important uh, issue. And let me tell you, China today would not be where it is if Mao Zedong and, and Chao Lai had not done for connectivity in the 60s. And in the 60s, there no question that China became a trader. Sometimes what we call unintended consequences of things are very important. Connectivity is critical. Now that's there. The problem which you also highlighted in the vision document is, and I give many examples there. I give the example of pineapples as one. I give the example of other things anyway. The naughty states by themselves, like many other states, are not sufficiently large by themselves to generate individual economic benefits. So you can do what you want. If the trade does not move beyond, beyond Manipur, you will never have more than informal trade. But the economics does not satisfy the region for large. You, you know, to get into modern systems of trade, as you mentioned, LC, etc., you need to get into larger trade. And the way the trade has functioned is what something we at least are not surprised at all. Because you know, as far as the person coming from there is concerned, he says the legal part stops in Myanmar, in Manipur. Illegal part can go beyond. So the illegal part actually is much, much, much larger than the legal part. I don't want to say those things. But that's not surprising because the limits of a trader is Manipur. That's it. Not going beyond that. So first thing we pointed out was that unless the Northeast states are being looked as a whole, Whatever be the reasons, you cannot think of any of them individually as very strong entity. Could Jorhat by itself be a great trading nation in North East, in Uttarakhand? No. So first thing is, how do you bring them together? And that, it was in that context, I made a very limited point, which I'll stick with. The location of Manipur is such that they are hostage to the sorting out of the insurgency issue. The roadways have come very late. The air has been there since the 70s, 80s, sorry, since the 90s. The roads have come very, very late. The rail is what everyone's been trying to concentrate on. I don't think that is to me the way of. To me, the issue is not how well connected you are with the main frame or how you are first connected to each other. Someone with Joe, sitting in Jorat is trying to figure out how do I connect to Alwani, he doesn't really care about Delhi. 
So first of all, connectivity within the Northeast is a critical thing for any further movement. And that's the only way you can make the Northeast a big enough market collectively. But individually, it will not work. And which is why I believe you can do whatever you want. You can change any trade procedures. No formal trade will develop. It's the same thing India and Pakistan is happening today. In India's trade, Pakistan's trade with Dubai is four times India's trade with Pakistan. It's all Indian trade. So what you are saying is happening illegally is really what's going to happen. So my question is, we have to look, because the region is such, not the landlocked, not just, see, Myanmar is a double whammy. They're not only landlocked from the rest of the country, they're landlocked within the Northeast which is worse, the others are not so. So the issue is we cannot solve this problem without that. That's the limited point I was trying to make, that I wish you would have seminars on Northeast, and not just on Myanmar, or in Nagaland, or in Mizoram. Are they independent uh, entities as far as the economy is concerned? They're independent political entities. They're independent maybe cultural entities. But are they independent economic entities? No entity or state by this country that. Now, when you say, why don't traders go? I always believe the smartest people are the traders. And sir, I don't know which area you work in. There's plenty of trade taking place from Myanmar to Nagaland and other parts of the world and through Mizoram, through the routes which they all know. I know generally the same person is a trader on both sides. His family, the he they won't let anyone else come. You know that very well. But that's what we should try to foster. We should try to foster as much informal trade as possible. I agree. Forget all this silly little more border and meeting. Forget that. Let them do it. What does it matter? How does what to suppose the total trade of more was let open, no duty, nothing, double, triple. It's a flash in the past as India's total trade is concerned. How does it matter? So I think that's going to proceed, but I'm still going to stick to my point that the holistic solution for Northeast, because of its location and because of the lack of not too friendly border points, Myanmar, not because they're not friendly, but they have their own problems of their own. And of course, the China on the other side, the only solution is that. I think that's all I want to say. I yeah, by and large agree yeah, with what yeah, he says. Yeah. Sonu, would you like to add something? Then I can throw it up. Yeah. <laughs> Just to add upon uh, the border trade that we've been talking about, uh, uh, I had the opportunity to also visit the uh, border trade point that Myanmar has with China. Uh, so uh, if we compare uh, the border trade, uh, uh, Professor Priyaranjan has already spoken a lot about uh, the actual problems that we are facing. Uh, so uh, uh, I just wanted to um, compare, uh, though uh, it's uh, very difficult to uh, replicate what's happening at Muse Ruli border, um, the border trade point, uh, the way they are uh, trading. But if some of those uh, things, some of those points could be replicated at Muretamu, probably I think uh, once uh, there is a peace um, uh, um, in the state and in the border region, then uh, probably some of those, uh, may, maybe a delegation could go and see uh, how uh, what Myanmar is doing there at Museruli uh, border trade point and the way they are implementing um, uh, the uh, um, trade, uh, the, the facilities that uh, have been opened there. So if those things, if some of those things, not uh, uh, not fully, but if some of those things could be replicated, I think it would be a, a great learning experience for us, um, especially uh, at Muretamu or uh, if we talk about uh, the Avakang, uh, Avakang or the Zokatar uh, border trade points uh, in other states. Absolutely. Uh, see what I can, uh, uh, the before, I, should I open it? I think I'll do that. Or you want to intervene a little bit? Just no. one point. Yeah. Just yeah. two sentences. Mm. Trade, after this normal trade in 2015, <laughs> okay. Trade here, which was recorded at the ICP was 18 million. But by 1819, it will become only 0.43 million. Okay. But on the Myanmar side, I went to the customs people, and from their computers, I got the data from them. You know how much it was? In the beginning, it was some 
41 million where is those 18 only yet more and in 1819 it was almost zero at more there in myanmar on the computer it was 89 million why so threat is still growing on and when i checked let those myanmar languages be translated it was all the threat that was being threaded now illegally in other words the problem lies in government of india and myanmar getting together and formalizing these threats which does not hurt indian interest or myanmar is interest we are not doing that thank you thank you so i i think let me open it up we have some time 10 15 minutes if that is fine with you any comment briefly or questions to any one of the please sir i am samrat ghosh uh, from uh, mohali punjab and uh, we uh, we work in an organization which is institute funded by the central government and we work on uh, how to solve india's problems uh, by at grassroots levels so i have a question i each of them each of you have enlightened me on this issue i just wanted to know since uh, this point has been mentioned how to integrate northeast and how to contain insurgency and how to improve uh, trading keeping in mind asian centric and northeast centric i just wanted to know uh, how much uh, influence china has on all these developments i just wanted to say something regarding this when we see the sort of posturing posturing that we are rightly right now seeing again in happening in ladakh where indian forces are confronting chinese forces that does not go down well with uh, china uh, they would try to see how to uh, create problems for india by throwing spanners and not this becomes a very good port for them and uh, especially when you people mentioned that japan is also showing interest to come and invest here china will not like that very much it antagonizes them similarly for asian when we see so much of chinese problem china is almost every day i see they are militarily so aggressive in southeast in south china sea which are these trading plot so i my question as a layman is can our northeast uh coexist if we try to have the sort of relationship uh, we are having with china because china we know what they do in arunachal pradesh we know what they have done with a staple visa whenever even even in asian games so my question to the experts in few words because you people have got what i wanted to know uh, can, uh, can we leave out china from this uh, yeah i think i'll take some more questions together if there are any co comments or questions vinita would like to introducing yourself this is on live but yeah. we are told in manipur in istv and sktv they are all listening many people okay. so people are not coming because they are happy at home <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, my name is banita devi nawre i am a irs commissioner of income tax and 98 batch of irs it's it's great sir to hear manoj pan sir and uh, ma'am sanu trivedi second time i'm hearing her and professor uh, priyo kumar sir it's yeah. amir priyo ranjan singh oh. so it's, it's it's great i mean when we hear from sir i could hear the you know the the, the kind of a dream the kind of expectations that india planned when we were looking into the when we are converting from the act look to act and from sir we knew the actual ground reality and just let me sum up by using one thing i was about to apply for a post in the land port authority of india so i checked up i checked up the data i saw you said that i said this is zero amritsar is so much why the reason is that so as you have rightly pointed out when we signed an agreement with myanmar and india a third party country is going to be the beneficiary the goods are not manufactured in myanmar that's the reason so obviously like things will go so there has to be a hard decision sir without a hard decision nothing will be able to happen it will not take off 
things will not take off in Manipur when it comes to trading. But again, necessity is the mother of the invention. As Sir has rightly said that we have come up in a big way in the you know agri sector. Amazing we are doing in the organic, you know, production of the things. And this crisis has made us stronger. Let me tell you. And then when I think and think. The only thing which is going to take off the economy of the Northeast and Manipur especially is the IT sector. I'm convinced. We have internet. Assam is going to be an IT hub. 25,000 crores is going to be invested in a semiconductor manufacturing unit in Assam. And Assam is a gateway to the development of Manipur. And let's take this opportunity. We just in the internet. And thanks to Corona, we know that we can work. And we have the brains, we have the people. Look at the call center here, all are from the Northeast. They're earning 20,000 here. If these companies, we can convince them to trust us, give us a chance in Manipur, let this, all these kids who are struggling here in the, you know, all these off the Burari and all these <coughs> inhabitable areas earning 20,000, which is not even sufficient, let's take them, employ, 500 youngsters set up. We have only got the IT sector. We have got already SCZ, make it functional. And this is the only way because transportation and those difficulties of insurgency will not be there. And we have the human resources to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Vanita. Any other? Yeah, please. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, I, actually, sir, my name is Raz Marintam. I'm from Manipur University, Department of Stats. And I did research on cancer analysis regarding Manipur due to the increases of cancer patients. So I just want to ask uh, one question. Did, uh, did the Manipur is capable for, uh, for, for startups? For example, I just want to go in details. Actually, I have my own company and we are starting manufacturing uh, and we are starting a uh, little bit different uh, against policies as I'm focusing on mainland India only. My market is based on this entire India. And my question is that, uh, just, I just want to compliment uh, Sir Priyaranjan. Actually in Manipur, when the Manipur government started launching startup, there was a lot of MSME were increasing. The entire notice that province Manipur, as per my knowledge, I am collecting the data as per my knowledge. The maximum MSME audio other registration is coming out from Manipur due to this uh, Manipur startup. But my question is that it is there are limited work sets where they in Manipur. Limited work sets. For example, some are in Likoti and some are in Tagil and some are in the sample sites. Their proportion is totally different. But my just, uh, my just uh, suggestion is that on this going uh, uh, changes of uh, globalization, but we need to produce maximum product from Manipur. But the, we, the youth from Manipur, have a lot of talents. One of my sisters was there. He want to come in Manipur to produce wine. He went in, uh, he, he's, uh, she's working in USA and sometimes he shifted to UK, but uh, she didn't have uh, still work sets. But my question is that there are a lot of startups are there in Manipur, but there is something limited work set is there. But if we focus on work set and it provide by the government in subsidy rate, then it will uh, Occasionally, it will increase exponentially, as per my knowledge. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think this point was also raised by Hero that they are all expecting some kind of a level of subsidy. Otherwise, they are unable to really come up to that kind of doing formal trading or manufacturing. So I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. Madam, Let's please. take an observation. I am a Koizen Rina. I am 97 batch Indian Audit and Account Service. I'm presently Director General in the Comptroller and Auditor General's Office. Uh, extremely delighted with the talks of all the experts. Uh, we have been aware of the Act East policy, the you know, Look East policy over the years. Uh, we've been following it up as uh, part of the bureaucracy and as, as a student of, uh, you know, of, of the country. 
Uh, but today's was very, very informative, and we did get to let, uh, you know, get to know a lot more of the inside story uh, from three different perspectives, and uh, particularly from uh, Professor Priyoranjan Singh. I got to know a lot more reality about from the economic side of, you know, what has been happening. So extremely grateful for all the the inputs that came out. Very, very insightful. Uh, so. We can't be, you know, we can't continue to be crying over the fact that we are lost in the jargon of policies. I think there's no denying that fact. We are indeed lost in the jargon of politics, politics and policies. I think that came out inadvertently. <laughs> I meant to say policy, but it came out as politics. But I think it's it's quite right, uh, you know, under the circumstances. But having said that, I repeat myself, we cannot be crying over that. We have to look at what we can do. And that's what we should be, you know, moving forward towards. The way forward should be on what we can do. And uh, as I think all the experts have been pointing out, we pointed out all the gaps. And one of the major gaps that we have identified is that what is being planned in the policy and what is happening in the ground reality, the biggest gap seems to be there. Uh, of course, there is a big gap in the implementation also. So as citizens of the region, as you know, citizens of Manipur, of the country and of the region. Uh, here, I think our representation is largely from the state of Manipur. Uh, we need to do something. I mean, I can't identify what that something is precisely, but from every angle, it can be through, you know, through education, through economics, through policy, through culture. I mean, through various means, we can't, we can't be fighting the country of India as a nation, but we as a region, as the Northeastern region, I think we really need to cooperate amongst ourselves. We need to come together as like-minded states, uh, not only like-minded, but we have to identify our common interests. Uh, that is the only way I think that we can fight. Individually, we cannot. It's not possible for us to be fighting a country or it's not, it's not even about fighting a country. I mean, we understand that a nation would have its own interests. And sadly so, the Northeast has not been a priority for anybody. So we have to make ourselves our own priority. And for that purpose, we all need to come together. We need to identify amongst ourselves which are the areas that we, and we can't wait for politics to take care of that. We as, you know, members of every kind of community needs to come together and identify the gaps. Uh, let the policies be like, like a simple thing, you know, when we talk about trade, you are identifying that the trade commodities are completely mismatched, there's a gap, and uh, uh, even though there might be a list prepared, that was not let known. So what are we doing at the ground level? So what commodity comes to us, what commodity goes out, does not have to be decided by somebody else. Let the policy be. That policy document can have 100, 100 items listed there. But we within the community also need to wake up, form our own regional cooperations, identify where, what we can send out, what we can get in. You know, that kind of cooperation is what I think uh, we really need. And we need to uh, sort of, you know, uh, formulate these groupings. Uh, and we need to reach out to the respective states. Uh, there might not be full 100% cooperation at the um, at the first level, at the initial level, but I think a first step needs to be taken. And uh, this forum itself, and I think various other forums where we call experts to talk about various uh, themes in the Northeast is a very big step towards it. Uh, it will always lead to, I think, bigger steps yeah. forward. Thank you Thank so you. much for these Thank enlightening and insightful Thank lines. you. Thank you so much. I mean, you have thrown as a challenge to take up and I'm sure our organizations is a small one old though but it had to rejuvenate and do something but now I think briefly maybe two minutes or three uh, we all of you can respond now winding up I think I do in interest of time I won't comment on the China thing it's a long question uh, but let me mention what someone mentioned about the IT sector you're right you know in fact there's a whole section on that in the vision document and the logic for that is that's the one sector we don't have to worry about on ground connectivity. And the second thing is that the heights of these, you know, hill areas like in my own home state are better suited weather wise to the IT sector. Now, why it doesn't take off? I believe that's where what you can do. If you can get your own money police and other Northeast people outside the state to get back to the state. 
and let those things take up like your startup they talk about i think that's easy because you can out you know i did that in a couple of states like music which is something i much into music for example you can out you can out uh, you know out uh, what do you call it compete any state in terms of cost factors in those studios and stuff like that so you can actually out compete but the question is that's something you can do and that's something which many of the issues i raise are not relevant but can be done that is easy to do uh, i'll just mention about the msme actually almost every sector all msmes as you know out of the msmes 99 percent of the m part micro and there is no difference between uh, northeast and the rest of the country there's you know, the it's really all about m's except for a few places like one or two areas in 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 manipur and maybe in the plain areas of nagaland the possibility of large scale industries is zero it's not going to happen so i believe that's very easy to do today the government for lots of reasons politics being one of them is very keen to promote msmes you might want to think in terms of approaching the phd cci PhD Chamber of Commerce Industry, who are doing a lot of work in MSMEs. If anyone wants to get in touch and establish contact with them, they can help bring, they can bring the demand side. You've done the supply side. Please let me know. I'd be happy to make the arrangements. I think I'll stop there. I don't want to go on too long. Very briefly, I would respond to the China and the Japanese angle. Uh, certainly, um, yeah, I'm sure all would agree the entire uh, activist policy uh, is uh, uh, focused towards uh, uh, engaging with our uh, ASEAN um, uh, countries, uh, the neighboring ASEAN countries, and uh, with the sole objective of counterbalancing uh, the aggressive rise of China in the region. So, uh, um, uh, this uh, again, I, I'm just uh, reiterating that. And uh, so far as uh, Japan is concerned, uh, 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 we see a massive investment by Japan in the northeastern region, not only in northeastern region, but also in Japan. And I mentioned about the Matabari port, how it is being developed, and also uh, Japan under its Big B uh, uh, initiate. Uh, uh, we call it as Big B uh, Bay of Bengal Industrial Growth Belt Initiative. Under under this Big B initiative, it is uh, developing industrial uh, corridor uh, in the Bay of Bengal, connecting it with the northeastern region and developing is uh, developing it as industrial corridor and focusing on the value chains so uh, 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 and this has been uh, in, in fact uh, intervention by um, uh, japan has been uh, has been uh, bel uh, welcomed by bangladesh as well as india just uh, to counterbalance again the chinese uh, influence in the region um, that was my response to uh, the, uh, to the china and uh, japanese um, china welcome that uh, yeah, Japanese coming and so much and certainly not certainly not That's what I said. Um, so the peace can, I, can I just answer to this yes, 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 yes. I have dealt with this uh, a, a lot you know for China uh, it, it's not bad I mean I I would like to I back to differ on that you know why China is building the belt and all these things is only because they're creating joke for their own people apart from the geopolitical issues look at in spite of trying to say we are enemy, that our, you know, the threat partner of India is China, maximum. You know, like what matter is economy for them? So I don't think, you know, it's like that to my mind, but you know, I'm too positive. I'm always with a hoping, always at the brighter side of life. But let me tell you one thing, sir. In Manipur, there's a, you know, Kahawa, no Purani, he went the, East door opens, Manipur will progress. And we used to think it is China. When the activist policy came, we were very happy. But by now we know it is not China, it is Japan. The sun rises in the East in the Japan. So we are wait, waiting for Japan, ma'am. And uh, please bring them to Manipur. They have a red hills, emotional connect, but they're investing in Mizoram, which I, they will come. They have to come and sir so will tell how to welcome them, how to bring them. Two sentences to say to Rina. Let us not cry over spilt milk. Let us think of what can we do from now onwards. In my report to the NEC, 
I had made three concrete resolutions. You can read that. Uh, others. Main thing is, let us, the government of India, renegotiate a new border trade agreement, which serves both our purpose. Number two, let us propose for an India Myanmar bilateral free trade agreement. We have it with Sri Lanka, we have it with Malaysia, we have it with Thailand at various stages. We must we do for a border, then for the free trade bilateral. Third, let us renegotiate, which India is already doing, Indian ASEAN agreement. Isn't it? Why? Because there are multi ASEAN uh, issues like motor vehicle agreement, like rules of origin, these are to be solved with ASEAN. I have made these concrete solutions. Who will build the cat? It's us. It's us. It's us. Let's build the cat. Okay. It's, it's, uh... <laughs> so uh, I close the discussion. The formality of thinking, you can invite, yeah, over to you if you remember. Yes, so it was a very delightful conversation, and I think uh, the answer has been given as to what comes first. Uh, the horse or the cart, I think economics comes first before security, and, and that is that that is the depth that we want to dwell in. And probably uh, going beyond this, maybe we should have a deeper conversation somewhere in Manipur, and the initiative should actually come from the CM of Manipur, and then he should be inviting economists and panel experts to actually talk on the table with bureaucrats, professors, research scholars, all that sort, to sit out and chart out a new roadmap. Right. So I think all the panelists. Over to you, sir, for the word of thanks. Thank you, Yoremba. Um, really, uh, we are enlightened by this uh, wonderful uh, discussion and very learned experts. I, on behalf of the Delhi Manipuri Society, would like to, you know, that uh, give a word of thanks to our uh, learned experts. And before that, I am. Uh, if I go uh, one by one uh, briefly, I, I was very much impressed with the theoretical, theoretical foundation and the theoretical idea that Professor Pant mentioned. Well, that I uh, say economics, what we when we talk about the development is uh, is not only the, the growth alone with the institutional changes that uh, you know all that uh, the crisis we are facing today is uh, you know it may be the first you say that. Uh, is the law and order situation, the infrastructure, and the, or the policies? All this I put together the institution. So I uh, to I not uh, uh, the stress much. The point is that the whole we are talking about the development is that the growth plus the institutional changes that are how that the, you know the the defects and the public policies and the government policies and the, beyond that uh, we are talking about. I use this term called social capital. What we have that our people that you know trust uh, and uh, develop the belief and that uh, you know the investors the how do the, uh, why do investors invest or why do they invest uh, so that is also altogether I put the social capital in city institutions so when the institutions are strong the when institutions are all in place then economic development growth can be accelerated so. Uh, the, uh, of course, at the, you know, the Professor uh, Trivedi has also, has also very clearly uh, not talked about the, the, you know, institutional fact that how that, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the foreign policies, the help in the, you know, threat and that, uh, you know, the India ASEAN or at the, you know, bilateral trade very wonderfully. And um, of course, to, uh, to Mr. Uh, Tokchom. Um, for ground reality, the how that you know entrepreneurs are that are facing, how that the entrepreneurs are that you know the uh, the encountering the difficulties and institutional that uh, uh, flows and institutional that uh, constraints the the people or that uh, the entrepreneurs are facing. 
Of course, at the, uh, no, last but not the least, the professor uh, that uh, the parents at the point called that the look, look is policy fail and that uh, egg is policy has not kicked off still. So it's a wonderful that the point that I uh, you know how that I connect with the uh, you know, question theory that how the institutional conflict or that you know the property rights conflict between the, the traditional institutions and that uh, the, the, the formal institution means a no formal and informal when that that then you know, conflicting is uh, the, how that you know development is affected right so all that that you know the property rights and the question theories that uh, i i do connect with that though i agree with you that you know how the public policy should be framed and how if that the policies are in place then um, definitely that we can move ahead at the faster and that i are uh, fingers crossed that uh, since that you are you know that the breeze between the the you know that the ground and with this uh, the system with the government so we, we hope that uh, you know institutions will be all in place and with this hope and oh, the last again the last again but uh, not but the least that the invitees and who have the, you know that uh, joined and effectively interacted and that the, you know the party you know the for making this uh, program success thank you once again and uh, we do hope that the this kind of program will continue and that um, we'll have the further more than effective discussions in future. Thank you. Thank you everyone, but let's have a photo together before we all take leave.